The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Frankly Speaking. I'm your host, Frank Seberic, and uh, today with me is um, on my guest is a very uh, exciting um, individual. His name is um, Reverend uh, David Richardson, and he's the executive director of New, the New Hampshire Bible Society. Yes. Dave, how you doing today? I'm fine today. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. No problem. No it's problem. First time in a long time I've been called exciting by anybody. I appreciate oh. that. Okay. So um, anyway, tell um, everybody, my audience, a little bit about yourself as well as the New Hampshire um, Bible Society and specifically how you got involved in this particular organization. Well, well, first of all, the New Hampshire Bible Society has been around for a, a very long time. It was formed in 1812. Wow. Uh, it was uh, during w what was known as the Great Awakening, which was a religious revival that swept through the country at the time. And uh, former governor of the state of New Hampshire, John Langdon, was the first president of the New Hampshire Bible Society. And that date, 1812, is important because that's the, the War of 1812. Uh, Langdon was offered the job of, as the Minister of War for the federal government, and he turned it down to remain in New Hampshire. And I would like to believe he turned it down to, to stay with the New Hampshire Bible Society to, to get the good news out to people, to spread the gospel out to people of the state of New Hampshire. I don't know that was his only reason, but I'd like to think that that was a big part of his decision. At one point, there were over 200 Bible societies with a similar mission throughout the uh, country. And now there are about 12. There's about a dozen left that I'm aware of. There might be more, but they, they don't participate in the national organization like we do, uh, so I'm not aware of them. So we've gone from about 200 during the Great Awakening. We're down to about 12. So I'm, I'm proud to, and I'm very happy to represent the New Hampshire Bible Society because we're still alive and still active, and we think our work is as important now as ever. Wow. So what is the difference? I'm a little confused here, Dave. What's the difference between the New Hampshire Bible Society and the Gideon Organization? And do you consider them your competition or your allies? Well, I, I certainly don't consider them competition. And, and I don't know enough about the Gideons to speak too much about them. I do know that they are an international organization. Uh, I, I believe they're headquartered out in, in Livonia, Michigan. I think that's their national headquarters. Um, I know that they, they currently um, uh, distribute at least three different translations. They still de deliver the DNIV, the New International Version, the Good News Translation, and the NLT, which is the New Living Translation. Um, and um, we are local. We are the New Hampshire Bible Society. And... and 99% of our efforts are geared to uh, the mission work of people in New Hampshire. And so if occasionally our, our presence might be felt across the border because we have churches on the border. Um, we also have churches that do missions work, uh, mission work in, in places like um, Haiti. So uh, I'm trying to source some Haitian Creole Bibles now. Um, we have uh, uh, mission fields uh, that churches go to in the southern part of the country and uh, in Latin America, so we try to get uh, Spanish Bibles for them. Uh, but predominantly, our work is here in the state of New Hampshire. And we work very, very closely with, with chaplains, pastors, Christian educators, uh, people who do outreach to homeless folks. And we work with them to, to get them the, the Bibles that they need. Um, and that, that's our that's our. our field. I, I came to the Bible Society in 2013, so I'm in my third year. 
Um, I had served a church in the southern part of New Hampshire until 2012, um, about nine years, and it was time to take a break. And while I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next, a friend of mine pointed out um, an ad in a not-for-profit a website for the New Hampshire Bible Society executive director, and I applied, and I was fortunate enough to get the position, and I've loved it ever since. Um, it is a part-time position, which allows me to serve a church part-time in my little hometown of Webster. So, uh, so that's kind of a roundabout way of answering the so question. So, Webster is a suburb of Concord. Webster borders the northwest side of Concord, and most people in Concord doesn't know it's there. And I grew up there. I love the fact that most people don't know where we are. It's a beautiful small town, uh, wonderful people. It's about uh, a town of about uh, 2,000 people. Ah. So um, as uh, the Gideon organization's not your competition, <clears throat> the Internet's not your competition either. Well, you know, in, I think it, it was perceived as our competition early on because uh, the Internet, you can get any Bible translation you want on the Internet. If you have the access to the internet, um, you have the access. You have access to a Bible. Yeah. The most downloaded app on a phone is the Bible, and so if you own a smartphone, you can access your, the Bible. Uh, and so the Bible Society really had to take a look at what is our mission now that the Bible is so accessible, and um, uh, so we look at um, uh, those areas where where. Uh, people can't download it. They can't get on the internet. They might not be able to afford it. Uh, it might not be in their language, um, and uh, and and other types of ways. So we we haven't redefined who we are. We're just trying to find that niche that's still necessary. But you're right. The internet, right? You know, I I wouldn't say it's competition because, uh, as as I, I alluded to before, wouldn't it be great if all of our denominations felt like they weren't in competition with each other and just Amen. worked and worked together. Uh, if, the, if the Gideons do well, we do well. If they do good work, we benefit. And if we do good work, they benefit. And if, if the Internet gets Bibles in people's hands, we're all, we all benefit from that. So it's not a con competition, but it did cut down on, on, um, on the people that call on us for help. Um, and so we are, we are just getting back to... Um, um, a point where uh, we're, we're getting our name back out to people saying, no, we are still here. We still exist. We still have a mission in this state, and we'd like you to take part in it. So in the past three years, for example, have would you say you've given out more Bibles or less Bibles? Oh, more Bibles. Uh, more Bibles than, than well, than, than probably the 10 years before. I've got a list here. I, I, I don't want to bore you with numbers. Oh, okay. But, okay. but this is just since... Um, January 1. This is just the first quarter of, of 2016. Um, we've delivered Bibles. I say delivered because we don't sell them. We do take donations, and, and we sell them to churches that can afford to pay a little. But we're not in the business of selling Bibles. We deliver Bibles to people, most of them for free. Uh, but uh, I delivered 60 Bibles to a church in Ackworth. And the great thing about my job is the Bibles come to my office. I make sure they're what we ordered. And then I get to drive around the state of New Hampshire and deliver them. So I've delivered all of these cases um, uh, as far north as Berlin and as far west as Keene. And, and so I get to see some of the state and meet some really great people doing marvelous work. But, uh, so I've been to Ackworth, Marlboro, uh, Farmington, uh, the, a, a Catholic church in Belmont, uh, a, a, an evangelical church in Peterborough, we, we delivered 12 recovery Bibles, and I'll talk about recovery Bibles in a, in a little bit. Spanish Bibles to an outreach organization up in Loudoun called Rise Again, and they have outreach in Nashua, Manchester, and Laconia, and they do marvelous work with homeless people. Um, Cheshire House of Corrections, the jail in, in Cheshire County, uh, 40 uh, recovery Bibles that we've delivered there. Um, 67 Bibles to the New Hampshire State Hospital this quarter, and uh, 30 Bibles to the women's prison. Uh, we delivered uh, 84 Bibles to an outreach church up in Andover, the little town of Andover, and then another f uh, 28 Bibles to the New Hampshire State Prison. And that's just a glimpse, that's just a, a, a quick look at it. 30 Bibles to Valley Street in Manchester, the, the Valley Street Prison. Uh, in all, we delivered over 600 Bibles in the first quarter. 
And um, so we're busy. And, and uh, considering that the, the, the board of directors that I answer to and I am part-time, um, we we, we're, we're trying to do as best as we can. The fruit of our labor, though, is not our work. It's the work of the chaplains. It's the work of the pastors. It's the work of the, of the missionaries who go out to the homeless folks. We're just giving them some of the materials they need to, to do their work. And um, they're the real, um, you know, bio, Christ tells us to go and, and do good fruit, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce good fruit. They're producing great fruit here. And um, uh, New Hampshire needs it, you know. Every state needs it. Oh, New yeah. Hampshire needs it now. Yeah, yeah, everybody needs the word sure. of God, that's for sure. Yes. So how, um, the $64,000 question, how do you finance your yeah, Bible? That's a, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Certainly, we do need some help uh, in that. Um, we don't profit from the sale of a Bible. If, um, normally, we give them away. And if somebody can afford to give us a little bit, I, I give them the Bible and say, make us a donation. Um, uh, and so we do get some donations that way. If a, if a church or an organization is, is, uh, has money in their budget to buy Bibles, we do invoice them, but we invoice them our cost. So we don't profit from the. I would never want to profit from the sale of a Bible. That's not who we are. Um, some of the prisons, thankfully, not all, about two or three of the prisons have budgets to buy books. And, and the prison powers that be, if you're the decision makers there, have seen the benefit of what the chaplains do there in, in recovery work. Um, you know, 80% you know, of the people in jail are, are considered to be addicted to drugs or alcohol. And the Bibles that we provide them, 12-step uh, program Bibles, um, Bibles that, that have more than just a text that a normal Bible has, but has testimonies and, and, and statements about how this applies to their situation. Uh, they've been so successful at at reducing the recidivism rate, people are going back to prison, that they've bought into this, and, and they'll reimburse us for our cost. Um, we do have an endowment that we're, we're living off of right now. Um, the people uh, were very generous in the 1800s and 1900s, and, and out of all the Bible societies that I'm aware of um, throughout the country, we probably still have the largest endowment. But we're, we're using that. Um, and I think the people that gave us that money want us to use it to, to put the Bibles out there. And if it's not a rainy day in New Hampshire, as far as giving out Bibles, we'll never see one. So, so I, I use it freely. But we could use some financial help, no question about it. People can go to our website um, and click on the PayPal button, and it's safe and secured. Um, I can guarantee them that, that we are a registered not-for-profit in New Hampshire. We follow the rules of the state. We get audited every year. Uh, by a certified public accountant, not associated with us, you know, it's an outside group, um, to make sure that we're, we are good stewards of what we get and uh, of the money that we receive. And um, so my board of directors makes sure that we follow the rules, that I follow the rules. But we could use some more donations to help us do this. Bibles are books, and books are expensive. Ah. We, get, we get a 30 to 40% discount from the publishers because we're considered to be a bookstore. Um, but those those discounts are going away because the publishing industry is in trouble because of the Internet. So so we could use some help, but we're going to be here no matter what. Ah, uh, Okay, let me bow. we probably get back to this a little later sure. on. But I just want to um, touch on a few things that are, are kind of confusing in reference to the Bible itself, the insides of the Bible. Um, specifically in uh, Acts chapter 8, you have a, um, a, um, a, um, a dialogue there between Philip. I don't know if Philip was an apostle or one of the saints there after the um, day of Pentecost. And he runs into this Ethiopian eunuch on his way to uh, Gaza. And uh, anyway, it, it goes um, that Philip asked this, he heard this, Ethiopian uh, eunuch reading out of Isaiah and Philip asked him you know do you understand what you're reading there and then the Ethiopian eunuch says how can I understand unless somebody teaches me and then long story short Philip you know ex explained to him about um, Isaiah and he tied in Jesus and all that but don't you think a lot of people, one of the, the biggest problems about the Bible, it's a very, very intimidating book. 
as far as like, you know, parts of it like the Trinity, the um, speaking in tongues, the genealogy of Jesus Christ and following that lineage sure. and stuff like that. And it's so, and not to mention, it's a very big book. I mean, there's 66 books to it and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I understand you're doing your part. You're doing mm-hmm. your part and stuff like that. But how, how do you answer to that saying that, you know, the Bible is fine and swell, like the people in prison and homeless people, but... You know, the next step is that you kind of lead them on to like a good Bible-based church or answer their questions and stuff like that. Understand what I'm oh, I, getting I, at? Oh, I do. And and there are other examples in the text uh, in the Bible of, of what you just talked uh, about, what you just read. Philip was one of the, the disciples. In fact, uh, when, when he's told that Jesus is from Nazareth, he's the disciple that says, does anything good come from Nazareth? So, oh, okay. So Philip was one of the original. Uh, but also in Nehemiah, uh, we're told that Ezra, the prophet, uh, read from the book of the law of God with interpretation. And they gave the sense so that people could understand the reading. That's, that's, that's the verse. It is important to, to know, th- to do more than just read it. There is an issue of understanding. And, um, you know, there's that old saying that the Bible says what it means and it means what it says. And I find that not to be helpful at all. And, and I yeah. find that to mean nothing at all. I hate to say that. And, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but it, it does require um, some deeper thought and some deeper understanding. And so, so that's one reason why we work directly through the chaplains themselves. And, and uh, we'll give a Bible out to an individual, no question about it. Uh, but we... We would like to make sure that, that just what you said, we, we give them that Bible maybe to, uh, um, to w- if it's the beginning stages of their journey, to whet their interest, but uh, maybe to replace one they've had for a while. But then we do encourage them to, to get into a group, a, a Bible study group. Um, one of my favorite things to do uh, of ever is to do Bible study. In fact, when I leave here, I'm going to my church tonight. We're doing Bible, I have a Bible study class. We're doing the Gospel of, uh, according to Luke. Uh, so it's important, uh, you know, reading it by yourself is fine. No question about it, it's fine. Studying with people is better. Studying with people who understand and have some access to some training is even better than that. Someone who understands that the Bibles were written in their own context. Uh, they've been translated from different languages into a lot of different translations now. I mean, since the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've got a plethora of translations that people can choose from. Um, and then also peop- someone who understands that you read the Bible in your own context as well. And um, so I, I like the phrase that there's the reading, the interpretation behind the text. That's the original context. There's the text itself. And then there's the, in front of the text. It's what we bring to the reading. And we have to be very open to that and, and, and a good Bible study class uh, makes us address those issues. So you're 100% right. Reading it, reading does not always mean understanding and comprehension. And, and so we do encourage uh, people to, to engage in the text with other people. Fellowshipping and Fellow, well, fellowship. Fellowship. First of all, the, the best thing about Bible study for me, it's the coffee hour that goes with it. And I get to check in with people. And, but then we, get to, we do talk about what it, what it means. You can't understand the New Testament, unless you understand the Old Testament. Because Jesus came to fulfill the prophet and the law. So unless you understand what the prophet and law was saying in the Old Testament, a lot of what Jesus is telling us is, is, is over our heads, you know, yeah. past us. So that's a great point. Understanding um, is important. It doesn't always yeah. come with the, just one reading or two readings. And it, the Ethiopian eunuch, a lot of people, there's a whole mess of people, even in church, that are like the Ethiopian eunuch. Oh, yeah. They're dependent on people, you know, telling them and helping them putting, you know, the pieces together, the, the connecting the dots. Right, right. And, you know, a lot of folks will start out reading the Bible. They'll start at Genesis in the beginning, and, and they want to go all the way to Revelation where it ends with the Amen, but they get to Leviticus, and for some reason they stop reading. And, and so in a group they might get through it better, and, and I don't ever recommend that you start at the beginning and go all the way through the end. I think that's, that's, that's a great exercise if you've read it before, but, but uh, that's just hard. 
And, yeah. You know, and so th th you're right. It, it's it's a book that we need to engage together. And and if you don't have anybody to read, well, certainly read it, um, um, and and engage with it spiritually. But but get in a group. It's so much better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So moving right along, we might get back to that sure. too. Sure. Um, <clears throat> One of the translations that on one of the popular um, Bible um, websites, BibleGateway.com, is my, one of my favorites. It's a great source. Great source. And I agree. I agree. And one of the translations they got there is called the Living Bible. And one of the passages, well, I'd like to read it. And sure. I, I'm just wondering, if you were a pastor going down to either Ferguson, Missouri, or Baltimore, Maryland, would you read this passage to a black church? And this is uh, Romans 13, um, verses 1 through 5 in the Living Bible. Obey the government, for God is one who has put it there. There is no government anywhere that God has not placed in power. So those who refuse to obey the laws of the land are refusing to obey God, and punishment will follow. And here we go. For the policeman does not frighten people who are doing right, but those who are doing evil will always fear him. So if you don't want to be afraid, keep the laws and you will get along well. The policeman is sent by God to help you, but it, if you are doing something wrong, of course, you should be afraid, for he will have you punished. He is sent by God for that very purpose. Obey the laws, then for two reasons. First, to keep from being punished, and second, from just because you know you should. Now, there's these we all know these bad cops just because you graduate from a police academy that doesn't make you an angel of god there's bad cops there's bad lawyers there's bad politicians there's bad used car salesmen bad pastors <laughs> bad pastors bad yeah. ministers amen yeah. Yeah. but this is this is a wrong uh translation yeah you, remember what i said you've got you've got the the, the what's in, behind the text what was going on in Paul's day. You've got the text itself, what was what in that translation, and then on this side of the text. The, the Living Bible translation was first published in 1971. 1971, and it was taken from a 1901 translation of the American Standard Bible. So if you look at what was going on in the United States throughout the 60s. Yeah, hippies and oh, oh, uh, Vietnam. Vietnam War, uh, uh, protest war protest on college campuses lsd drugs oh sure you know a lot of stuff was going on. so i the u.s was in a lot of turmoil in the 60s and 70s civil rights movement so it really uh, uh i i don't have a problem with the word policeman there instead of what most translations put as authorities because there's a fine fine line between police and authorities or authorities are a little broader the problem I would have is if if we didn't do what we just talked about, would I read that to a to a, a church in Ferguson or Baltimore or Chicago or, or to a black church like that? First of all, not without the pastor's permission, and and secondly, um, uh, not unless there was a time to discuss it and put it in its context. Thankfully, um, the Living Bible has been replaced by the. Living, a new living translation in 1996 and that word police is out and it's back to authorities i went through I, uh, all of the different translations that i have in, in our bookstore and they all say authorities they, they took that word policeman out which i think is was an unfortunate translation in 1971 yeah. you know i think it was well intended um, i think it was uh, meant to do good uh, but not all good intentions work well so i so i don't want to you know, I don't want to be judgmental about that, that, that text, but what I would say is this. We, never, we should never be afraid of reading any scripture to anybody if we have the time to discuss it. And, it's in, and the reason, I, you know, the next verse, the next few verses, um, if you don't mind. Oh, go ahead. Uh, for the same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due them. 
I would love to go to Wall Street and read that <laughs> to the white guys in the three-piece suits more than I'd like to go to Ferguson, Ferguson and Paul. read the other one. Yeah. But Paul's letter to the church in Rome is, is this wonderful piece of writing. And you can't get to this verse unless you've read the other 12, that chapter, unless you've read the other 12 chapters. And, and to tie it all in, you, you, we really need to make sure that we understand that in, in, in verse 12, he goes, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And so when you tie it in with that earlier passage, it really puts it in a much better context. And would I go to Ferguson and read this only if I could do so in a way that would help heal that community and, and say in a way, you know, folks, you need to get along with your authorities. And authorities... You have an oath, and you need to act better as well. Just what you said, there are, there are, there are, there are, there's bad, bad folk cops, on yeah. both sides. Yeah. I was a cop for eight years, I, I, oh. uh, and I, I worked with wonderful people. But I also know that police departments feel sometimes that they are ostracized and that it's us against them. And so would I, read that? I would read that in such a way, I hope, that would, we could stop doing the us versus them and just let everybody know it's us. Um, I'd also like to put that in context. Um, Paul was Jewish, right? And yes, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was converted, but he didn't lose all of his Jewish tradition. And he was a good second temple educated Jew. And he had a different view of, of God's work on this earth than, than maybe the, the normal Christian. And, I think it's okay for us to say, Paul, I think you're wrong about authorities being appointed by God. In fact, if you read Revelation, um, uh, the authority, the book of Revelation tells, tells the people not to go along with the authorities. Yeah. Um, in Luke's gospel, um, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by the, by the devil, the devil says, I have been given this earth under my authority. Worship me. Well, so that doesn't necessarily jive with Paul either. And that's why it's so important to go back to your other question, studying the collection of books we have here together in total. I love to think of Bible uh, uh, as scripture as a symphony. Right? And if you know the William Tell Overture, you know that a piece of that was used as the theme song for the Lone Ranger. Right? And so symphonies don't, Orchestras don't like to play that anymore because when you get to that point where the trumpet sounds, some knucklehead in the audience is going to yell out, I owe silver. <laughs> and that one little section pulled out does damage to the whole symphony. So when we read scripture, we have to look at it as a beautiful piece of music that's tied together from the beginning to the end. We need to be very careful about plucking out pieces. Wow. And, and that might ruin the whole symphony. And so I would recommend that, that you're right. We need to be very careful about going into a neighborhood and reading something like that uh, because, it, because it, it would not be successful. It wouldn't be appropriate uh, unless we could talk about the whole picture. Um, in the days of slavery in this country, plantation owners would, in, would have their slaves go to church. They'd sit them up in the balcony, and they'd make sure that the minister would read Ephesians to them. And Ephesians says something to the effect Slaves, be good to your earthly masters, not because you fear the whip, but because Christ Jesus uh, bids you to be so. And, and so the church was complicit in, in slavery with that. The slaves would go back to their cabins, and someone who knew their Bible would read Exodus and liberation. Um, and, so, and so we need to be careful about picking stuff out. It happens far too often. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I, again, I try not to, I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. They don't mean to do it. But in some way, um, it defeats, I think, the purpose of the Bible. I think Christ w wants to empower us. And when we use the Bible to have power over somebody, we're wrong. And, and that's a pretty good indication that they're not doing God's work. But when they use the Bible to empower people and hold them and lift them up, that's a pretty good indication we're in this together. So that's a, you, that one question you asked, 
we could talk about that for days. Yeah. Well, I've just been informed by my producer that we're ready for our break here, a halfway break. So hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, you'll join us for the uh, second half with my guest, uh, Reverend Dave uh, Richardson. Hope to see you soon. Hi, my name is Stephanie Clark, and I'm the executive director for Amira. We're a faith-based nonprofit in the North Shore of Boston that provides a refuge and safe home for women that were sex trafficked. I know what you're thinking, sex trafficking, like that happens over in India or Cambodia, right? Well, actually, it's something that happens right here in New England. And the majority of women that are being trafficked grew up right here in New England themselves. And so what we do is we come in and we provide whole person care, helping them to break free from exploitation on their journey to liberation. We would love for you to engage with us about this topic. It's huge, and we need all the help that we can get. So you see our website right below me, www.amiraboston.org. Please go there, begin to check out what we do, and begin to see that you can actually become a partner with us in this incredible work. We also have a fundraiser coming up on Saturday, April 9th at the Ipswich Country Club in Ipswich, Massachusetts from 10 to noon. It's a brunch. There'll be incredible voices of hope there. A local survivor will be sharing a bit of her story. So we hope that you can join us for that great event. Again, uh, we're Amira. We're a faith-based nonprofit that helps women that are sex trafficked. And we need you to partner with us in order to continue this great work. Thank you so much. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the second half of this uh, episode of uh, Frankly Speaking. And with me today, I've got Reverend uh, David Richardson. He's the executive director of the New Hampshire Bible Society. And we've had a, a pretty good discussion here on um, the Bible and um, distributing Bibles as a ministry, which is basically the whole objective behind uh, the New right. Hampshire Bible Society mm -hmm. within the state of New Hampshire. And um, I, I guess a, a lot of great advertising points that, well, God himself would give you. Uh, for example, Isaiah 55, 11, my word never comes back void. That's a good selling point on what to inspire people to, you know, get their nose in the Bible and, mm -hmm. you know, study it to the best of their ability. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15 is pretty good. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I mean, I think that might be the, the only time, I could be wrong, that says, you know, what you can do to be approved unto God. And everybody, I think, wants to be approved unto God. I would, I would hope so. We, we can always def the, discuss what that means, but I think in our own way, we want to be approved in doing right by God. No question about yeah. it. Yeah. And then another one I found in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and the sonar of thoughts and intents of the heart. So that's, I mean, and where the power is, there's knowledge and application of mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not the, you know, the physical Bible itself that's going to be a sword that's going to protect you in war or something like that. So Right, I agree. I, I, the Bible just sits there. Exactly. We have, to, we have to pick it up, we have to read it, and we have to engage with it. Amen. And, and that's what, where the improvement comes, where the improvement comes. That's where the transformation takes place. And I and I like that word. Um, so you're right. We we need to we need to engage with it and read it and and even argue with it if we want to. There's nothing wrong with you know. Um, and and uh, have a, a good discussion about the texts that we or the scripture that we read. Some people don't like the word text. The scripture that we read, um, and that's where the transformation happens. Ah. Uh. And one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard outside the Bible, it's um, Justin Peters is, well, he's not paraplegic, but he's got like muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy. And when he walks, he uses mm -hmm. a cane and you could tell that he's got like muscular dystrophy, but he's an outstanding man of God. And um, he, I guess he has a lot of qualms about these pastors and ministries that rely on dream ministries. And, you know, it's kind of like a cheap, lazy way of, you know, not tapping the Bible. You know, you're depending on dreams, saying, you know, what did I dream last night? Maybe that 
has more application than the Bible itself. So anyway, Justin Peters says, if you want to hear God speak, read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak audibly, read your Bible out loud. Yeah, and I, I love that quote. Um, St. Augustine, um, I, I'm not Catholic, so Protestants, I don't know saints, but St. But Augustine uh, wrote City of God in, in 405. And uh, he was a bishop of the, of the early church. He wasn't a religious man to begin with, and he didn't like the Bible that he read. He thought it was crude and not very well written. And as he was walking by a church, uh, he heard something being read, and he said, what is that beautiful language? I mean, what is that beautiful writing? And he went in, and, and, and he wrote afterwards that, that the Bible needs to be read aloud. And, and I, I, I agree with that. Um, we read it aloud in church on Sundays, and, and I encourage my people not to follow along in the book, but to just keep, you know, read it when you get home, but sit and just listen to the word being read. And I, I, I think it's far more powerful that way. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I think he's, a good, he's right. Like, and I knew of another preacher. I, I, I mean, maybe he's taken this verse out of context, but he does it. He does it anyway every time he studies his Bible. I guess there's a, fa- a, a, a verse in the New Testament somewhere: "Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God." Something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And he uses that and says that every time he studies his Bible, he reads it out loud. So I guess it's more, you get the eye contact and you get the ear contact type of thing. You got two senses working for two you. Two senses working. That's important. It so really is that's, important. Yeah. there yeah. might be something to that. Mm-hmm. Um, another interesting tidbit I heard, it was on a, a popular morning um, show I listened to, and they tend to tap like Ripley's Believe It or Not to have interesting, fascinating trivia mm-hmm. on on their radio show. And the, the thing that they brought forth, that the most stolen book in the United States of America is the Bible. Is that kind of awkward? Or? Well, I, it probably is. I, I don't doubt that. It's the most widely purchased. It's the most widely owned, so it would make sense that it's the most widely stolen. Um, uh, you know, it's pro- one of the least read. <laughs> People own a Bible, they don't read it, so it might be easy to steal it as well. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that yeah. at all. And it's, it's you know, when, when Peter Gomes, Peter Gomes was, was he, he's, he's dead now, but was this wonderful preacher. And um, he was the chaplain at the Harvard University, and he was in charge of the Memorial Chapel there. And when he started there, there were no Bibles in the chapel. And he, he said, why are there no Bibles in the chapel? And they said, well, we're afraid people will steal them. And so it, he said he argued and argued. And he said, I finally won my debate, and there are Bibles in the chapel. And thank God, some of them are stolen. <laughs> because however we get them in people's hands, let it, you know. Yeah. I, I, so, you know, it depends on why they steal them. But, um, exactly. You know. Exactly. I mean, if they want to tap like the verses, I, um, you know, the wonderful works of God, study to, you want to be approved unto God, Second Timothy 2.15. I want to be approved unto God. What does God say is the will for my life? Mm -hmm. I want to steal a Bible and find out. Um, But, I mean, if you legitimately can't afford a Bible, then, you know, contact uh, (laughs) Reverend Richardson here. or We have plenty of them. We can give them out, right. Definitely. And a lot of churches, too, work on that same basis. Mm -hmm. If you really, really want a Bible, they'll give you one. Right. But if you're like uh, Lindsay Lohan, for example, who goes on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, and she's, she's an actress that has like a zillion dollars in her bank account, for the thrill of it, she shoplifts, you know, different like uh, handbags mm-hmm. and scarves. And I, I guess it's, there's a rush behind it, from what I understand. If you're that kind of person, you might want to ask Reverend uh, Richardson to pray for you, because in that situation... Well, true. I mean, there's, there's. I'd like to think that that even if they steal it, perhaps uh, at some point they're going to read it. <laughs> and if that's what it takes, then then I'm okay with that. But if they're just going to steal it and throw it away, um, there's a better use for it, and we need to work on that person's behavior certainly. But um, you know, whatever it takes to put it in their hands, um, I'll I would work to do that. And 
So if somebody needs one, I'll give it to them. If, if they need to steal it, I'll leave it out there for them. <laughs> you know, there you go. Whatever it takes to, 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 to get them to, to open it up and start to read it. Amen. You know? One of the most bizarre testimonies that I've ever heard in my life, I was watching one of these Christian shows. I don't know if it was like Daystar or the Trinity Broadcasting Network. And um, these, um, I, I, um, a mega church evangelist out of Arizona, I think his name is Barnett, and he has a son who followed, sort of followed in his dad's footsteps. He's got a, um, a ministry for troubled youngsters out of Los Angeles. I, I think mm -hmm. it's called the Dream House. And um, one of the troubled gang members, former gang members or whatever, came in, you know, wanted to straighten out his life. So they gave him a Bible, and he proceeded to tear, like, page after page out of the Bible and roll a reefer mm -hmm. out of it and smoke a joint. So, uh, you know, I guess he came to um, the, um, the one day he ripped out Romans chapter 10, the page with Romans chapter 10. And it says, uh, you know, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead for his sins, thou shalt be saved. Saying, but this is interesting stuff. I think I want to elaborate a little bit and see yeah. what else it has to say about salvation. Long story short, that particular young man, uh, got his life straightened out, accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and is now uh, um, um, an instructor at that Dream House um, facility for troubled youth. So that's, talk about God working in strange and mysterious ways. Well, you know, if, if you remember the parable of the sower, and the sower casts the seed, and sometimes it lands on the hard rock, and sometimes it's in the thorns, and on the trail, and only rarely does it land on the good soil. Our job is to cast the seed, to sow the seed, and not worry about where it lands. And, and heaven forbid we're not sowing the seed the day that that hard rock is the fertile soil. And so that's why, yeah, it's not good that people steal, but if, if that's what it takes to get a book in someone's hand so that maybe they will start to read it at some point in their life, uh, I, I'm not overly worried about that. Uh, you know, um, it isn't, like we just said, it's not the book that's important. It's what's in the book and engaging in the book. And, and they can't engage it with it unless they have it. Amen. Uh, and um, we provide a, a smaller version of a Bible for the homeless folks that we, we serve. It's just this size. And uh, because they don't want to carry, I mean, they're homeless. They have no place yeah. to store it. Yeah. And, and during the winter, uh, someone made the comment, how do we know they're not starting a fire with it? And I said, if that's what they need to get through the night, I'll give them a new one in the morning, and maybe they'll start reading it in the morning. And I said, let's not judge their motives. Let's just get them through the day. Okay. Um, and so, so um, it's important to put it in their hands for the day that they do open it up and, and finally look at it and read it. So. Amen. And one thing, I, one thing that th this brought up, I'm, I was at a Wednesday evening um, Bible study here um, last Wednesday, and one guy asked for prayer. He um, shared the gospel with an individual. I, I don't know if it was his, his co-worker or neighbor. He didn't really say. In fact, he didn't really know the guy's name. And then he asked, he had an extra Bible, gave it to him, and says, oh, this, I heard that this is like a lucky charm. I always wanted a Bible of my own because this will probably bring me good luck. But, I mean, there's Christians like in the Middle East that are getting their heads chopped off and they're not very lucky. Right. So it's right. good to, to tell people up front there's nothing magical about the Bible to, uh, unless you, like, apply it in your life. And even then, if, you know, sometimes Jesus and God will put you to the t your faith to the test. Like he does to the, um, like the missionaries out in the Middle East sometimes, and sometimes they lose their life over. Yeah, it. I, I guess that that might be one case where I do get judgmental. <laughs> where, yeah, where it, it, you know, where people who who aren't truly engaged in the faith, but but make statements about it. Um, Christianity, all you know, is not a feel good religion. It's not designed to make us feel good about who we are and everything's great. It challenges us. If we read this text seriously, the, the, the scriptures seriously, it challenges us to transform our lives to be better people. And sometimes 
we don't feel good until we're done. You know, yeah. and, and Martin Luther, the, the, the monk that gets a lot of credit for the Protestant Reformation, he had some horrible, horrible, lonely nights of despair. Um, and yet he, he knew his scripture very, very well. Um, so there's no guarantee that faith makes your life uh, perfect. Faith helps you get through the troubled times in life. And also, I mean, if you believe Christianity, oh, I, I, I don't know what exactly is going to happen like eternity with God and Jesus in heaven, but it's going to be a, probably a lot better than what we're having on earth right now. That's the promise, isn't it? Yeah. That's the promise. That's right, the and, you're, and you're right. We don't have a real good image of what that's like. Uh, uh, the, the image that most people have of heaven has more to do with Greek literature than it does with biblical literature. It's, we're more informed by, by Greek, writing, Greek writings and, and, and la, um, people afterwards. But, if, but what's in here, uh, it, in, in the Bible itself, is, is, is not very informative, is it? And so, so if we, we don't know what's next. All we, all we know is it's, it's better um, than what we have here. And I think God doesn't tell us that because he doesn't want us to be in a rush to get there. <laughs> you know, uh, oh, committing suicide! Yeah, or you know, like don't that. be in a rush. It, it, it'll be here when you get here, kind of with that, you know. Ah, uh, I'm, I'm not sure every pastor will agree or like the fact that I say that, but that's all right. Yeah. Ah, okay. Now let me bounce something off of you. I've got, um, you know, I don't want to brag a boast or something like this, mm -hmm. but I have um, a, a, a fairly good quality Bible. Yep. It's soft bound and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which is better than the hot covers. It has the thumb um, things for to quick references mm -hmm. on getting to books. It has the ribbon for a marker. Mm -hmm. And since I had cataract surgery a couple of years ago, it has large print. Right. Because if. Otherwise, I need a magnifying glass sure. to read it. So, I mean, this could probably go like double or triple what you could get a Bible like in Walmart, a regular mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. that the um, the Gideon people give out at hotels and motels. Mm -hmm. So would you give a person, you know, that's uh, hotter than their luck or whatever, that can't afford one, a Bible like this? I, I, I would if that's what fit their needs. Um, I, I have a, um, um, a sense that some, and I know this is not what you're saying, but some folks say that poor people shouldn't get good things. And, and, okay. Right? And, and I really rail against that. Um, it, it's fine. I, I, in the church I served before, we, we had a, uh, a food drive for the food pantry that we had. And you always have to go through the food to make sure that it's not out of date. And as a, as a way to get people to really pay attention to that, I had a little contest to see who could find the oldest piece of food. And um, this was in 2010, I, I believe. And, we, and somebody donated a 1984 package of Hamburger Helper. And I thought, well, first of all, that probably lasts forever. But, that was, yeah. but that's not the point. The point was they felt that the poor people who were going to get that didn't deserve something better than 1984. They went to the cupboard. And, uh, so I, uh, poor people deserve good things, too. And, and so I would make sure they got the best book that fit their circumstance. Homeless people couldn't carry that book around. And so that's why we give them something like this. If they have a place of residence, maybe in a nursing home, they would get a large print Bible that size, maybe not with the, um, with thumb the, with the thumb, the, thumb uh, the markings like the dictionary and, and like yeah. your Bible has. Or the ribbon. Oh, the ribbon, you know, yeah. and I give them a bookmark. Um, yeah, you know? that serves the same purpose. Sure. And uh, <laughs> some of the poorest people are in prison. And, and the prison wouldn't, some prisons in New Hampshire, wouldn't let that book in because it's too big. And oh. it, it could be used as, as a weapon. Um, and they require soft cover. Um, and so we would, we, also were, were, we would meet their requirements as well. But I, I would give that poor person whatever that person needed in order to read the book. Um, if, if they couldn't handle the large print because of size, I'd, I'd get them uh, glasses. We, we have purchased glasses for people to read the book. Ah. Uh, um, and, you know, the idea is to put the book in their hands. Uh, our, 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 our literature says we put the God's word in the hands and hearts of the people of New Hampshire in a form and language they can understand. That's what we stand for. So to give them the book, if they can't read it, I need to give them glasses too. 
You know, I don't pay for prescription glasses, right? But but readers, you know. Oh yeah, the, you could the, get them at the dollar store. Exactly. For, I've got I've got like twelve of these around the house, you know. And and uh, there you go. I and so I would give those. So, but I I would make sure that 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 person got the best available for them, um, and and I would use our discounts and and uh, because it, it really bothers me that that some folks think that just because someone's poor they don't deserve discounts, and. Um, I, I learned that in a mission trip with a youth group to New York City, and they were throwing clothing away, and you know because they were ripped and torn. And, and I said, "Well, why are you throwing the clothing away? Are you making money off the rags?" And the guy said, "The people deserve good." And, and it was like an eye opener. People deserve clean clothes. They deserve good clothing. And um, and so we make sure that what we give them is is suitable. And so I I live by that. We make sure I make sure that we give whatever is suitable to the person who gets it. Hey, I've got a question. I know it's not in the Bible anywhere that if you have a, like a worn out Bible or, or one that you, you want to discard, maybe somebody gave it to you, gave you a new one for Christmas or something like that. Is there a, a, a protocol of what you're supposed to do to uh, discard a Bible? I, I don't think so. I don't. Uh, you know, uh, what some people do is uh, they, they, uh, uh, they'll put them in, in coffins for people. You know, people, they die. They, I never thought of yeah, that. Yeah, you know, uh, that's, but that, that's limited, isn't it? We have far more Bible. Uh, to, people just don't want to throw Bibles away. And I have... Because lots, God will punish them well, or something like that. Well, that's what they're that. thinking. Yeah, I, that, I have yeah. cases and cases of old Bibles uh, in my office that people just don't dare throw away. And so they let me, they, they, may, they have me throw them away. Uh, I gave a tour of my, my church was built in Webster, the church I serve. It's a beautiful old church. And I, I gave a tour just yesterday of the bell tower. And upstairs in the bell tower is this box of old Bibles. They have to be 75 years old. They've been up there forever. They're covered with dust. And I'm thinking the person that carried that box up there didn't want to throw them away but put them in a place where no one would ever see them again and make them useless. So why not just throw them away? So what I do is I take them to the town uh, uh, recycling center, and I put them on a table. And if people want them, they take them. And if they don't want them, they go in the hopper. And, and you know, um, it's a book. Yeah. This part is just a physical book. It's what's in it and what it says that's more important. And Amen. So, so if you're not going to read the old one and know it, why, why give that away to somebody else to have to deal with it? I don't want to see it fill up our landfills, but I think books and paper can be recycled. What a good use for them. Yeah. You know? So um, people should not be afraid of of recycling books. Bibles. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully they're worn I, out. They're so worn out that you Yeah, well, a true can't. story. I was confirmed in my church when I was 16, and they gave me a little red cover, New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. And I took it home, and my cat shredded it. And, and then proceeded to get sick all over it. And I said, oh, my goodness, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. Because, you know, God's going to, yeah. you know, that kind of, a, well, you know, I went to church the next Sunday. It all was forgotten, and they gave me a new book. And, and, and they said, don't worry. that." And what a great, you know, just, just at, you know, we don't worship this, right? We do, we do not worship the Bible. We worship God, and we use the Bible to help us do that. And Amen. so by not wanting to throw the Bible away, that's a, that's a form of idolatry which the Bible tells us not to do. So I think it would be healthy for some people to just, you know, rid, uh, to uh, toss them in a hopper. Yeah. Uh, you know, from an environmental standpoint, recycle them. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. but from, from a theological standpoint, Okay. Throw it away. How we met, how me and you probably met, was at the annual Soul Fest in August. Yes. Um, did you, you've gone the past two or three years? Yeah, this will be my third year going to Soul Fest. Okay. At Gunstock, yes. Gunstock in the first week of August. Yes. And um, so you, your, your New Hampshire Bible Society had a pretty uh, successful um, tenure, uh, whatever you want to uh, objective. At Soul, at Fest? Soul Fest? We, yeah, our, our goal there, it, it's kind of like preaching to the choir. I mean, we go up there with, with, with che the cheaper, I don't want to say cheap, but in, inexpensive because we want to be good stewards, giveaways. And 90% and of the time, People will say, I have that Bible, or I have that. So it's, it's preaching to the choir. But we go up there and make connections. And I met a real estate broker up there last year who hands out Gospel of John, the little tracts, at his real estate office. And uh, so earlier this year, I delivered a, a case of 100 to him so he could, he could hand those out. 
So it's all about relationship, isn't it? And, 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 and making connections uh, so that we can further our mission and help him with his or, or every. Um, uh, last year, we got asked to find some uh, Haitian Creole Bibles for, for a trip, and so that's what we're trying to do. Um, so Soul Fest is a great place to make some connections. Ah. So you you told me before the before the show you're gonna try the zip line that starts at <laughs> I the bone. I hope to. And I hope to. I, I you know um, one of the things I did when I took over uh, at the Bible Society was to cut expenses because I felt we needed to, and so I I, I don't have the part time help that that I'd like to, but I'm gonna have some other people up at Soul Fest to help watch the to staff the table so that I can take a break. And one of the breaks I want to walk up to the top there. And I I want to try that zip line. That looks so much fun to me. Like so much yeah. fun. Especially when it's like 90 degrees outside and the wind just goes yep. through your hair and stuff like that. It's, yep. It must be nice. I never tried the zip line, but okay. So I was told we've got about less than two minutes left. Um, if they want to, if people want to contact the New Hampshire Bible Society, they can go on BibleNH.org. Yes, BibleNH.org is our website. Yes. Okay. They can also, um, uh, if they Google us on the internet, they'll, they'll get our phone number. They can call um, uh, the number, um, and um, my cell phone is on that answering machine because I'm not always in the office. I'm out delivering as well, and and, uh, um, and so uh, I'll I'll get back to them right away. Um, they can help us in three ways. People can help us, in th- certainly they can they can make a donation. Okay. Uh, more importantly, they can tell people we're out there and we exist, and that we can help people um, in their ministries. And then they they can say some prayers for us as well to make sure that we do. The work in a humble and and um, uh, in a righteous fashion, and I think that's important. So, certainly dollars, but spread the word that we exist, and and say some prayers for us. Yeah, amen and amen. Yeah. So, um, I can't think of anything else. I think we'll, um, um, but I uh, thank you very much for for coming on my show today. I well, really appreciate. I hope that. I haven't put you to sleep. You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> not the, at uh, all. The uh, uh, pastors are known f- to be verbose. We can talk a lot. And um, I, I, um, I, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. I mean, I, I love Bible study. No question about it. And um, so the Bible Society is a real good place for me, uh, um, along with that little church in the town of Webster, to, to, to carry out my calling. Um, so I'm thrilled to have been here. And I'll come back anytime. Great. I might take you up on that. Okay. Definitely. So um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, for joining us on Frankly Speaking. Join us again next time, and uh, take care, and God bless. Thank you. Seating program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.